Bonjour Mathieu. Salut Aziz. So hi everyone, welcome to the this seminar which is co-organized by the uh, French speaking Society of Theoretical Biology and the Applied Math of uh, Le Havre uh, Normandy. So it's our pleasure today to welcome Mathieu Desroches um, from INRIA in the south of France, uh, Nice. And so he will talk about slow fast analysis of neural bursters, old and new. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot. Thanks Jean-Pierre and Benjamin for the kind invitation. And thank you uh, everyone for uh, attending uh, one more Zoom event. It's becoming a, a big part of our lives. Uh, let's hope that it uh, decreases a bit in the, in the next few weeks or months. But anyway, so uh, this is the title. There's gonna be, let's see if it works. Yeah, it should work. There's going to be some bursting rhythms and also link with excitability and some pretty cool animations. So now you're, you're warned. And I also added new word because I will present a number of uh, things that I've done with uh, many colleagues over the years. Not everything is completely new. Certain results are a few years by now, but some of the stuff is, 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 is more recent. Okay. So talking about bursting, so these are uh, a number of experimental time series that I found uh, with the help of my friend uh, Google Image. And uh, there's no reason to convince you, I'm sure you all know very well that uh, uh, life is often, very often oscillatory and uh, with quite complex forms. And a lot of cells uh, have uh, very complex oscillatory patterns, uh, neurons, of course, but not, not only, also uh, these pancreatic cells, for instance. So there's really very many uh, beautiful oscillations, but quite complex. And we like uh, mathematics and mathematical models. So there's a lot of uh, work done over the years to try to model these uh, complicated time series and see if we can understand that. So that's what I'd like to discuss in the next uh, so many minutes. Let's see. Um, so I will talk about bursting for most of the time and in um, multiple time scale, most of the time with explicit time scale separation, ODs. So a minimal setup for uh, to obtain bursting oscillation in, in, let's say, smooth ODs is three-dimensional systems uh, where two variables will be fast and one slower, which is the because of this small parameter epsilon. Okay, there are uh, ways to obtain bursting oscillation with less variables, but you need to add something. Uh, it may be noise or time delay or, or, or a reset even, but with smooth ODEs without any of these, you need at least uh, three variables. And this um, H, so it starts quite uh, bad. This is Z, of course. I hope I won't do that for an hour, otherwise you will be bored. Where Z is such that it oscillates in a region of bistability. So they are, main idea that there is a sort of slow oscillation uh, in the region of bistability of, a, of an oscillator XY, and that may produce complex oscillation of bursting type, and XY will be called a fast subsystem. Okay, so this is the outline. I have quite a lot of stuff, but uh, it's a lot of it is pictorial, and I hope it will be uh, uh, enjoyable. And if I see that I'm too slow, then I can accelerate here and there. So let's not worry too much for now, at least. I will start by recalling some important results that I called old, but there's nothing pejorative here. These are very important stuff on slow fight dynamics in 2D and 3D and bursting oscillation and their classifications and more recent uh, work that I've been involved with. Okay, so um, we will discuss specific solutions called canards. Sorry, let's hope that yeah, these things goes up. Um, which are very important, in particular uh, in um, slow fast oscillations and in particular in bursting oscillations. So I guess a large number of you have already heard of canals, but I would like to recall briefly what, what these are with the prototypical system in which they've been uh, first um, presented and analyzed in, in about 40 years ago by a group of French mathematical mathematicians, sorry, Eric Benoit, Jean-Louis Callot, Francine and Marc Biner. This is the so-called uh, original paper or seminal paper on canals. 
So this is the Van der Poel oscillator. That's a skin screen capture from this uh, paper with the fast null line, the X null line, and superimpose some cycles that you can obtain for different values of A. But if you see here, maybe it's not so easy. The, the difference in between these two uh, parameter values is, is extremely tiny, and yet the cycles are very, very different in phase plane. In particular, uh, their size is very different. And also, they stay close to the middle branch of the cubic null line, uh, which is repulsive for reasons that we will recall in a moment. So that's a first important aspect of these limit cycles. So these are stable limit cycles for Van der Poel. Another interesting aspect that has been uh, uh, popularized quite a lot and associated with the term canard and canard explosion, because if you look at the bifurcation diagram, with respect to this constant uh, parameter, uh, constant forcing A, then uh, you have a stable equilibrium uh, for A greater than one or smaller than minus one, but then there's a hop bifurcation. Initially, the envelope of the cycle looks uh, as expected from a, a, let's say, a normal form type of system, but at an order distance epsilon from the bifurcation point, you have a very sharp increase in the norm or even amplitude of the cycle within a very narrow parameter change. And that's what has been termed, uh, not in that paper, a bit later, explosion. So one way to try to understand, uh, at least uh, without too much uh, mathematical complexity, because there's a lot of uh, complica complicated maths papers associated with Canal, but one way that stays simple and still gives a, a window towards understanding what canals are is to look at the limit epsilon equals zero, in particular in this time parameterization where epsilon is in the X equation. So if you take epsilon equals zero, this is what you get. The, the, the slow dynamics persist and the fast equation uh, is replaced by an algebraic equation. So the fast dynamics um, is not, does not disappear, but it's hidden within this algebraic constraint. Uh, you can manipulate a little bit. I'll, I'll recall in a moment how to do that. And you can um, reveal or regain the X dynamics in that epsilon equals zero limit of that parameterization, the so-called slow limit, because um, the slow equation persists. And you get, you regain the fast dynamics. And it's, it's written like this. And what we can see immediately is that if X is plus minus one without A being plus minus one, then this uh, quotient will uh, tend to infinity and then therefore the dynamics will cease to exist. So there are problems when X equals plus minus one and in the slow limit and that corresponds to these four points. So if we zoom near this one, when A is not plus minus one, this is the locally the, the, the cubic null line. And if you look at the face portrait of that slow limiting equation, then this is what you see uh, when you are uh, near uh, <clears throat> minus one, you have the flow points towards the fold, but there's no equilibria. So there is a problem. And this is because the, the flow is not defined there. So there is what we call a jump point. When you switch on epsilon, you will have a jump from slow to fast dynamics. Uh, same if you're near um, plus one. And uh, in fact, here it's, a, it's also a jump point, but the arrow points in opposite direction. But nevertheless, there is a problem at the fault in that limit. However, there's a little bit of not magic algebra, let's say, but it's, it's, it's very nice. Uh, when A equals one, you can do the calculation for this system is very easy, then the singularity disappears and the flow is well-defined all through. There is no equilibrium. You can also check that the flow is constant, uh, constant spin in that case, but you go continuously from one side to the other. And this is, uh, again, a glimpse of this idea of canard dynamics. So following the uh, attracting and then repelling side of the, of the cubic null line across the fold. When epsilon equals zero, you can get some understanding that this is possible. If you perturb, then um, this, uh, cubic null line, which for the epsilon equals zero system, at least this slow limit uh, is an invariant object. It becomes the, the phase space of that uh, limiting system. If you perturb, then you can show that there is indeed a value of A close to one, but you can compute an expansion in epsilon of that value for which there is a, a similar behavior. So there is a trajectory that goes from the right to the left continuously doesn't, doesn't jump and it seems to have the same canard type behavior. And this can be seen, one way to see it is a connection between 
the perturbation of the attracting side and the perturbation of the repelling side. By perturbation, I mean objects that are called slow manifolds and that are uh, quite tricky to, to study, but they're, they're, they're well documented. And for specific parameter values, they may uh, coincide and connect. So this point in the limits, when there is this possibility, is often called a canard point. And by perturbation for small enough epsilon, you can get this kind of dynamics. If you see this uh, purple trajectory again as a connection between uh, two um, not fully invariant but locally invariant manifolds, then um, you can have a breakup of that connection, a similar, a bit similar to what you have in a homoclinic near homoclinic bifurcation, and it can break in two directions. So if it breaks on one side by perturbing a little bit the parameter a, then you create a configuration of this manifold in such a way that you can understand why you will have this behavior. So you go along the repelling side, but then you are ejected towards the left and you may have a canal cycle, a large canal cycle. Whereas if you break the connection in the opposite direction, then you can uh, intuitively see that you will have the possibility for this kind of canal cycle. So after the following the repelling branch, you will go back towards the right attracting branch and you have a small canal cycle. So a little more about these Van der Poel dynamics. So this is again the bifurcation structure. These are the uh, so-called slow manifolds and they are well uh, controlled and understood by uh, results by Fenichel from the 70s that are a few years before the, 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 the paper uh, about the Van der Poel canals. And they guarantee the existence of perturbation of the branches of the null line, but near the folds, these results are not applicable and you need other techniques to understand what happens near the fold and the possibility for canals. You can also look at these uh, systems uh, numerically and uh, observe how they look like and along the bifurcation branch from small headless canals to the largest of these, which is often referred to as maximal canals, and then canals with head, so the ones that after following the middle branch, they go to the left and uh, have a larger and larger head, so to speak, up to the uh, relaxation cycles, which have no canal segments. So effectively, in a nutshell, you have a very rapid transition in parameter space from the, uh, let's say, the robust behavior before the hop, which is uh, stationary, to the robust behavior after, so to speak, which is the relaxation. But it's not discontinuous, it's just very sharp in parameter space. And this is this sort of uh, pictorial representation of connection between the slow manifolds and possible breakup. Okay, so um, a little more details about uh, this kind of dynamics. If we take now a quadratic system, which would give the same, give the same dynamics, but with only uh, one fold. Again, you can look at the epsilon equals zero limit. And here you can try to understand the, the slow flow. So the flow on that algebraic, uh, the, the object defined by the algebraic constraint and with the dynamics, the slow dynamics that persist. So we can easily uh, draw the, the flow on this parabola and see that different, depending on the value of A, we will have an equilibrium, a stable equilibrium here, but you have the problem at the fold. For A negative, you have an unstable equilibrium on the other side and there's still the problem at the fold, even though the direction uh, is opposed to each other and for a equals zero here. So since it's not the Van der Poel system, everything happens at a equals zero. Then there is this possibility to cross when a is zero, x dot is minus a half. So the flow is trivial and you go from one side to the other. This is the so-called singular canal behavior. And uh, again, with these simple uh, algebraic manipulations, you can understand why this is possible. So bursting, like I said before, is in 3D. So these configurations in 2D are very interesting. We would like to know how to pass on to 3D systems and see if this kind of uh, slow fast dynamics can uh, happen in, in 3D systems. So before that, one way to visualize um, yet one more time these 2D uh, epsilon equals zero dynamics of uh, Van der Poel type system is to show the, the singular slow flow <laughs> But in 3D, where I put different slices uh, corresponding to different value of A, and I stack them together to obtain a 3D picture. So this is what we discussed earlier. And this is that 3D picture where you see that only at A equals zero, you can cross from one side to the other. 
And now the idea of a simple way to go from 2D to 3D is to take the same singular limit and now add a drift on the parameter A. So uh, intuitively, it's a bit like taking this picture, imagining that this is like Play-Doh and pushing in that direction. And if you do that, you can convince yourself that this is what will happen. And of course, you can uh, do the calculation and verify that this is indeed what happens. Um, this is for a specific choice of the drift. So here for this system, I need a, a negative drift to create that particular uh, dynamics. And OK, there's a number of things to do to really understand what happens. But one thing that we can see on that picture already is that whereas before there was only one way to cross from one side, the attracting to the repelling side at A equals 0, now there's many, many trajectories that do so. So we have a the singular limit of a 3D system. And um, effectively, the, the, the phase space of that singular limit is now 2D on that parabolic cylinder instead of being on parabola. And you have infinitely many uh, initial conditions that will cross the fold and go to the other side. And they all do, since this is the singular limit. So there are really specificity. These are uh, more complicated objects. So you lose the uniqueness in particular. They all do that through a special point, which used to be what we call the canard point. And a canard point with a drift, at least this particular drift here with this particular sign, will be called a folded node. We'll see in a moment why this term. But effectively, you add one more dimension and you have way more trajectories already at epsilon equals 0 that have this canard effect. So we expect that by perturbation, there will be uh, more types of canards and more rich. In fact, yes, indeed, if you perturb, so this is the epsilon non-zero system whose slow subsystem is what I showed before. Well, this is just a quadratic system as before with, OK, uh, another inconsistency. What I called A is now called Z. I apologize. But this is the same system. And by perturbation, you see that now you don't have infinitely many solutions that may cross robustly, but you will have certain uh, solutions that will indeed go from one side to the other and will be canals. And in particular, they will have this very specific behavior that while crossing from attracting to repelling side, they will make some oscillation near the folded node. So the specific trajectories that cross from one side to the other, there are two specific ones that are sometimes called primary currents. Let's not worry. But there are also these more complicated uh, solutions that are of canal type and that have these oscillation in the middle and are important in particular in a number of uh, uh, application systems. So I will come back to that in a moment. Just a few more details about this folded node uh, system. So this is the system I started from in epsilon equals zero. That's the slow limit. And effectively, like I said before orally, but here I give a few more details. What you can do to recover the dynamics of the fast variable, which here it's x, is to take uh, the uh, time derivative of this equation, which should be satisfied for all time, and substituting for y the uh, end, <clears throat> yeah, yes, just y, the dynamics that persists in the in the epsilon equals zero limits, and you obtain this equation, and z is untouched, and uh, you could also write it with the minus two x in the denominator here, which would again tell you that there are problems for some values of x. Here it's x equals zero. So you end up with that system that is similar to what we had in Van der Poel with some singularities. Uh, in Van der Poel, it was just one point because the fold was just one point. But here, we have a one-dimensional fold. And there are problems along that fold for any value along that fold. One way to understand a bit more what happens is to do a specific time rescaling that is a little bit unusual because it depends on the state variable x. And to introduce this auxiliary system, where effectively you've changed time by multiplying by this factor, which was causing the singularity. And you obtain a system that is now defined everywhere in the plane, xz, including for x equals 0. And this system, which is completely regular, may have an equilibrium. In fact, since you have uh, rescaled time by a factor minus 2x, the minus 2x has appeared in the z equation, which creates the possibility for an equilibrium, an equilibrium at x equals 0. And that's this point here. You can analyze its uh, linearization and see what type of equilibrium it is. 
If this equilibrium is a node, just a bit of vocabulary, this auxiliary system is called desingularized reduced system because reduced system is another name of slow subsystem and desingularized because we had to do something to understand what happens near x equals zero, which was causing problem. So if we have a node equilibrium in the desingularized system, so this is the, the face portrait of a node, but on a folded surface, because we started from a, a system that had these constraints. However, so we can understand this system completely because it's very simple, there's no problem. But the original system, the slow flow, the one that we're interested in is before the time rescaling. And the effect of this time rescaling, so the difference between these two systems is the orientation. So they have the same geometric uh, orbits, but the time orientation will not be the same because you multiply by something that can be negative. And effectively in this example, you have to reverse time on along the, the blue half uh, parabolic cylinder on the repeating side. If you do that, then you can understand the flow of the slow subsystem. Here, you don't have an equilibrium anymore. You have exactly what, uh, something similar that you have in Van der Poel that is no equilibrium and you can flow through in finite time through this point, many trajectory through this point. Again, you use uniqueness in these singular limits. And what you see also on this picture is that to the left of this now called folded node, a bit like a node, even though it's not an equilibrium, but it corresponds to a node of this DRS auxiliary system. And it is on the folded manifold. I guess that suffices to understand the, the term. So to the left of the folded node, you see that this line is still a line of singularity. So the slow subsystem is not defined. It's not defined on the right anymore for an opposite reason. So the flow points towards the fold in both direction. However, we have managed to understand that there is a possibility to resolve that singularity exactly at zero and that where the folded node is, where in Van der Poel, you could see easily that the flow was finite all true. So we still have the possibility for canal that epsilon equals zero, and there are many more. In fact, this entire uh, wedge of initial condition will flow continuously through that point and make it to the other side. Okay. So this is just a, another view of the same thing with some computed trajectories at epsilon equals zero. So these blue and red are specific epsilon equals zero trajectories and one for epsilon non-zero where you see that indeed you can have this canard effect and there is also this rotating uh, dynamics that I have not explained, but uh, in the interest of time, uh, I will uh, skip that, but you one can understand why you make these oscillations nearby. Okay. Another configuration when going from 2D to 3D, uh, like I did before, starting from this uh, static picture and adding dynamics in A, is to do the same thing with an opposite drift, that is a drift of opposite sign. And here what you can construct is a different scenario where now you have a so-called folded saddle, which can be seen as a canal point with an opposite drift, opposite to, to folded node. And here the scenario is, is quite different. If you follow the arrows, you will see that here, there is only one way to go through. So it is uh, more sensitive, so to speak, a bit like uh, uh, what you have in uh, the face portrait of a saddle. So this trajectory indeed crosses to the, uh, oh, in particular, sorry, this is the attracting side. So this trajectory goes from attracting to repelling. So it has this singular canal effect. There's another quite specific trajectory that does the opposite from repelling to attracting. Uh, it's often called a uh, false canard or faux canard, and every other trajectory um, will either avoid the fold or uh, go to a point where the slow flow is not defined. So effectively here we have only one singular canard and one singular faux canard. So very different scenario just by changing the sign of the drift. The same uh, strategy to understand this folded saddle uh, scenario using this auxiliary system. So the DRS as as a saddle equilibrium. And here we can see that this strange time rescaling is a bit, has a bit the effect of flattening the, what was a flow on a surface. Now we have a regular flow on, in the plane, but the original flow, the, the original slow flow, the one that we're interested in is indeed on the surface. And owing to the, this uh, time rescaling, we have to reverse the arrows on the, upper side, they are the repelling side, and we understand this one possibility to cross and the other one to cross in the opposite direction. So one singular canard, 
one single on four count. Okay, that was a bit long, but we'll use these two scenarios to uh, construct, uh, let's say, uh, new types of bursting dynamics. If you have the folded node scenario and you have a, a way to recurrently pass uh, through the fold, first uh, on this picture, the red and blue uh, complex uh, surface are computed slow manifolds. So they are perturbation of the parabolic cylinder, which is defined for epsilon equals zero. And these are defined for epsilon small, but non-zero. So they are quite complex and they have also the this rotating motion that they that, that appears in the trajectory. And if you have a dynamical way to pass recurrently through this region near the folded node, may it be uh, uh, smooth or non-smooth. So in this case, it's, it's not smooth because this is a, a Fitzhugh-Nagumoro type uh, neuron model with a, a synapse uh, variable, which activates to a heavy side function. This is why you have these kinks, but anyway, then you can have uh, complex uh, periodic solutions with small oscillations that correspond to the passage near the fold node and large oscillations when, when you have a, somehow this excursion away from it and back in the vicinity of the attracting side. So they have been uh, studied a lot, these kinds of um, time series in many application contexts and also theoretically. So this is more of a neural context, but they've been studied a lot also in chemical reactions in the uh, 80s and 90s. And, in the neuroscience uh, or the neural context uh, a bit more recently, 90s and 2000. And uh, there's a lot of work done in uh, trying to relate these kinds of uh, time profile to uh, time scale separation in the presence of a folded node, but there are also other scenarios. And this is a beautiful uh, recording from um, also found on Google image, I guess. Thank you, Google image. But what I find nice is that this is irregular. Of course, there's uh, very, reg um, I mean, there's no such thing as uh, completely periodic recordings, but anyway, we can see that there are small oscillations in between spikes and they don't look too noisy. This is why I selected this one. So they really look like experimental, uh, almost folded node induced mixed mode oscillation. But anyway, that's just an example. Okay, so let's go back to bursting because this is what I wanted to discuss today. So again, this is the setup. So here we have a different type of uh, uh, repartition between slow and fast uh, variables. Uh, all these folded singularities, you need one fast and two slow, whereas the minimal bursting setup is two fast and one slow. But we'll see soon uh, how to connect the dots. So this is a sort of generic system that would produce bursting. And we, uh, as discussed before, we take a, a scenario where the XY system is bistable for an interval of values of a certain parameter z. So when epsilon equals zero, we have a bifurcation diagram with bistability between equilibria and limit cycle. And if we um, switch on epsilon and z as an appropriate slow dynamics, then given that there is an hysteresis loop um, due to the bistability and the possibility to go from one family to the next through uh, to the other one through bifurcation points, then we can obtain bursting oscillation. Here, this is an example of square wave bursting. And we can see that as a slow passage through uh, this uh, fast subsystem bifurcation diagram and the bifurcations that allow to understand the transition from the quiescent phase, where you slowly follow attract station stationary attractors of the fast subsystem, and then to the uh, burst phase, where you slowly follow the periodic attractors of the fast subsystem. And the transition between these is a limit point on one side and a saddle homoclinic on the other. Okay, this is a standard square wave bursting. We can try to cook up a simple slow dynamics for Z that would do that uh, given this particular scenario. And so in the slow fast uh, jargon, this would be the critical manifold. I may have not mentioned this term before, but that's the cubic curve for Van der Poel. So the fast uh, null cline or null surface, depending on dimension. And now if we uh, play a little bit with parameter values, we, can, we would like to understand uh, how these bursting oscillation come in, in the full system, what sort of bifurcation scenario we have in the full system. So in this example, we can have a stable equilibrium and depending on parameter values, we can move the slow um, null cline. It's a plane, but in projection, that's this line. And as it crosses uh, the fold, then you can have a half bifurcation. And the cycles that emerges from this half bifurcation looks very much 
like a canal cycle. So you remember the Van der Poel system because the fast uh, null Klein or critical manifold is also cubic shape, but here we have two fast variables. So what is going to be the canal explosion in this case? So if you um, go a bit further uh, past this hop bifurcation, so there are multiple ways to see this transition, but uh, in this particular example, which is uh, the Inmarsh Rose bursting model, so that's an interesting system because we can do a lot of analysis. It's polynomial and it reproduces a nice bursting patterns, square wave bursting. If you take this parameter, for instance, which is reminiscent of an applied current in a neural model, then this is a fully formed uh, bursting cycle that I plot in the 3D phase space together with some uh, interesting object, for instance, the uh, y null surface and the intersection between X and Y null surface. So that's the critical manifold. So this is this cubic curve. You see that the quiescence follows it. And then near the fold, you go away, there is the burst, and then you come back. But OK, so how do we go from a stable equilibrium for certain value of Ys to a stable a bursting cycle of this form? Then one way that this can happen, and it's the case in this in Marshall's model, so this is the uh, z uh, dot equals zero, so the slow, slow plane, is uh, through a sequence of uh, canard explosion that effectively uh, take this um, small cycle that was born to a half bifurcation and we make it suffer a number of uh, transitions that will bring more and more spikes to this cycle. And after multiple uh, such transitions that you can see here on this uh, by computed bifurcation diagram, every kind of quasi-vertical transition is a passage to this uh, canard behavior, and you can add more and more spikes and eventually reach the uh, bursting regime. So this is an animation to show you how this may work for the first two spikes. So starting from, uh, I will run it one, once full and then maybe stop a little bit, starting from a small cycle, and what you can see is a growth that resembles the, the Van der Poel canard explosion. However, when you start to pick up fast dynamics, okay, there are some additional limit cycle in the fast subsystem. So that's uh, justify that there's oscillation there, but let's not worry too much. The most important part is here. Once you start to pick up uh, fast dynamics, then it is, uh, indeed uh, related to the fast variables. And we have two fast variables here. This is why you have this uh, um, fast excursion and uh, that connects to the, the slow part of the cycle. And at some point, what you can see is that that fast excursion comes back very, very close to the homoclinic bifurcation and the homoclinic connection of the fast subsystem. And this is the only way to be able to connect again to the slow manifold. So before, if we take one cycle here, then you follow the slow manifold, so this is a canard segment. You go away, so the fast dynamics takes over X and Y, you make a, a loop. But when you, can, when you come back in this region, you're too far away from the slow manifold to have a chance to connect to it. Uh, canard's uh, effect are exponentially small effects, so you have to be exponentially close to the slow manifold in order to connect to it. But uh, if you do this excursion close to the homoclinic connection here, then you have a chance to come back very, very close to the critical manifold and therefore very close to the repelling slow manifold. And this is what happens when the parameter has moved ever so slightly and you come back very close to the homoclinic, then you can connect and start a second canal transition which will resemble very much the first one and allow you to add a second spike. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of evokes a bit when you're uh, knitting and you're trying to uh, add more and more uh, loops into the, uh, the knitting, uh, let's say, results. So we will see it maybe a bit better once projected in 2D. So this is, again, the same bifurcation diagram, but just in the ZX projection. And here you see what happens. You add the first spike and you get stuck near the homoclinic. This is where a second canal transition can happen. And when the second spike get also near the 
from a clinic of the fast sub system, then you can connect again and so on, and you can add more spikes. And that's one way, at least in this system and other types of system of this sort, that you can go from a spikeless cycle through uh, multiple canal explosion and grow uh, what in the end will be sufficiently many spikes such that we can talk about a burst. Another example, very similar, but uh, more biophysical is the Maurice Lecar model with the third uh, equation that is linear. So studied by David Terman in particular from the perspective of this spike adding. I think that's one of the first papers that discuss that. And here you see a computation with the cubic critical manifold and uh, cycles that add more and more spikes upon parameter variation. And each time you have to visit these, uh, uh, these intermediate trajectories that stay close to the repelling site. So these are canals. And so you have multiple canal explosion. And in the end, you have uh, cycles with a number of uh, spikes during the burst, so proper bursting cycles. So that's the scenario where the canals are interesting because they explain how in parameter space we can bridge the gap between a stationary regime and bursting regime. So they are very much related to some bursting excitability, so to speak. And talking about excitability, so this is just a, yeah, another illustration to show that in a number of models, and uh, in particular in the neural context, spiking models and bursting models, these excursions near the middle branch of a cubic null cline, which correspond to uh, canal dynamics, they uh, are very much uh, related to excitability threshold. And in fact, in these types of models, so these spiking models would be typically type two um, neural models, then the excitability threshold is well approximated by, by um, a maximal uh, canal segment. So here we can uh, take uh, parameter values where the only attractor is an equilibrium and give a kick. So instead of a constant uh, forcing, we can have a a, a, a kick in I and cross or not the threshold to kind of mimic the transition through the excitability threshold. So this is the spiking model. And for a bursting model, is it is a bit similar. So you have this canard segment that you will visit during the spike adding transition, which again happens in a very narrow inter parameter uh, interval parameter and uh, separates, let's say, the equilibrium or stationary regime or rest state, so to speak, from the bursting state. So in, in these kinds of system, uh, canals play an important role to understand excitability. OK, one small parenthesis before I can move on, and time is running, so I will better accelerate, about uh, bursting and bursting classification. So we have the pleasure to have John Rinzel in the audience, and I will I'd be very happy to recall his seminal work on uh, classifying bursting patterns and proposing uh, mechanisms to understand in models how to distinguish between them and also how these complicated uh, periodic solution uh, can emerge. And he proposed initially uh, three classes, square wave, elliptic, and parabolic, depending on the shape during the burst and what happens during the quiescent phase and also what happens at the level of the, um, the frequency during the burst. A bit later, this uh, classification by John Rinzel was extended by Eugene uh, Yuzikiewicz by uh, following the idea that you need to consider uh, basically one bifurcation of the fast subsystem that will uh, allow to understand the transition from quiescence to worst, and a second bifurcation that will allow to understand the transition from burst to quiescence. And then you can have uh, quite a few more uh, bursting uh, profiles. Talking about bursting classification, there was this, another approach. So there's this paper by Bertram and colleagues. And then later on, it was uh, formalized, uh, maybe with um, more mathematical details uh, by Martin Golubitsky, uh, um, Krasimir Yoshik, and Tasso Kapper. But um, again, about the same time of the Zikiewicz paper. So here, the approach is, is different, is to try to classify bursting patterns through uh, uh, higher co-dimension in parameter space and uh, identif identifying uh, families of burster through these higher co-dimension point and uh, obtaining the different types of bursting within a family by taking slow passes in parameter space around this higher co-dimension point. And there is a recent, uh, well, like uh, four or five years ago, paper in Journal of Mathematical Neuroscience by Sergio et al. that also uh, 
kind of review and extend a little bit this approach to classify bursting patterns. But these approaches, uh, which I've written really seminal and allowed uh, to uh, understand much better how to construct bursting systems and, uh, and, and, and relate them to uh, uh, all the um, experimental recordings that, that have been also accumulated in various contexts, they uh, rely a lot on the analysis of the fast subsystem and its bifurcation structure. And what I would like to discuss in the time that, I, that is left is that you can also look in addition to the slow subsystem and that may give uh, complementary information. Okay, end of the parenthesis. So let's move on. So in fact, uh, yeah, I've used a lot of my time, but I've not shown you anything, uh, let's say on the new side of things or let's say more recent side of things. But now I will give you a few examples of uh, what I've done with collaborators uh, over the past few years to try to see if we can uh, construct new types of bursting oscillations and understanding them by mixing fast and slow subsystem analysis. So the first example, which we called uh, MMBO or mixed mode bursting oscillations was uh, kind of uh, the idea of um, plugging together uh, two Lego, you know, the bursting Lego and the MMO mixed mode oscillation Lego and try to see if we get a, a bigger Lego just because we like it. And uh, this is what we've done, starting from a square wave burster, the, again, this in Marshall's model that I showed you before, and adding a slow variable, because since you have this parameter i, for instance, that gives you the spike adding transition from um, stationary regime to bursting regime, then you can imagine adding artificially, of course, uh, at least in this example, um, uh, slow dynamics on I, which will just have the effect to make the extended model have recurrent passages through the spike heading regime. And what it does is it creates this kind of uh, even more complex um, oscillatory profile where you do have bursting oscillations and in between you have uh, small oscillations that resemble what you have near a folded node. And uh, this is um, not surprising we constructed it to obtain exactly that effect because we know that if you have this spike heading canard explosion then in the terms that i've introduced at the beginning of the talk you somehow have in the slow subsystem a canard point and so if you add a slow drift you will have a canard point with the drift you will have a folded node and the folded node will create small oscillations but you still have two fast variables and so you may have burst and then you combine bursting dynamics and mixed mode oscillations. And this is what this uh, simulation shows. So this is the model. Of course, uh, we tried to see whether we could also connect to the more theoretical results uh, from folded node theory to control the number of small oscillations. And uh, if you s decrease epsilon for this particular model uh, enough, then you can indeed uh, verify that the, the number of small oscillations follows the uh, theoretical prediction. This is a view, uh, a different 3D view where you see really the, the burst and the passage through the folded node. So this surface here is the critical manifold. Uh, you add one more slow variable. So you have uh, two slow variables and, and therefore you have a 2D critical manifold with a fold and a folded node. So you can do all the computations. Of course, this work is uh, not rigorous. We don't prove the existence of this object, but we can prove that there is a folded node and um, do a number of simulations to also, uh, let's say, uh, support our uh, explanation and the way we constructed this model. Incidentally, after publishing this paper, we found uh, a very interesting paper from the lab of uh, Steriad from the 1980s with a number of time series. These are recordings of thalamic neurons. And this particular time series caught my attention because it looks very, very similar to uh, what we obtained with that mixed mode bursting model. So that's uh, serendipity, but it's still nice because it shows at least one example where such behavior could be obtained in, a, in an experimental recording. This is a burst. And here you see really a very specific uh, type of slow oscillation. You have a rise as if you would have another burst, but it's failed. And then the you go down and, a bit faster than the than this rise, and the next time you have a burst. So this is well captured by this uh, too slow, too fast model with both a folded node 
and uh, the ingredient for square wave bursting. So that was nice, and I'll come back to this in a moment. In fact, I'll come back to this now. Sorry, I forgot a little bit the uh, ordering of my slides. So this is also one thing that motivated something that I've done with other colleagues, uh, in particular John Rinzel and also Serafim Rodriguez uh, more recently, is to try to generalize this idea of a mixed mode bursting oscillation. So the idea to the general idea would be you take a system that has a folded node and you take a, a system that has a fold initiated burst. So a bursting scenario where the, you start the burst through the passage near a fold bifurcation of the fast step system. And you try to see if you can combine both and have something that we would like to call more generally folded node bursting. This is a bursting solution. There are two fast variables and we can apply the faster subsystem analysis to understand at least part of this bursting, but the slow subsystem will also be important because it will tell us that there is a folded node and this is the reason why you have this subthreshold oscillation here. So that's the idea that I've just uh, recalled here, but that's precisely what I've just said. And you can see this uh, folded node bursting as a slow passage through a spike cutting canard explosion that you would have in a fold initiated burster. So here are a few examples. You can play this game with a number of fold initiated bursters. So if you have fold homoclinic, which is the, the way Izikiewicz calls uh, what Rinzel calls square wave, then you can add a slow dynamics and obtain folded node homoclinic bursting. This is the time series. And this is the one phase place projection. And this is, uh, let's say the underlying bursting scenario with a number of uh, cycles along the spike heading transition. And this is the bifurcation diagram that shows the spike heading. I mean, there are multiple explosions, but they're stacked on top of each other. But you can have also other scenario. If the, the initial burster is a fold up scenario, then you would have fold a node up scenario. I mean, it's a bit mechanical, but it's nice because it gives access to a, um, a let's say a new family of bursters that you construct by assembling uh, for the node dynamics and previous, previously existing bursting system. And a third one, if the end of the burst is through a fold of cycles, then you can have folded node fold cycles. This is again the same assembling of time series, uh, bifurcation of the underlying burster and uh, phase space projection. There is another type of folded node bursting uh, dynamics that we consider is when the uh, folded node somehow uh, happens on average during the burst. So in the envelope of the burst and here, I don't have much time, but the idea is that you still have a slow passage through a canard explosion, but not a spike heading, a torus canard explosion. So what is a torus canard? So very briefly, a torus canard Loosely speaking, is like a canard explosion, but with a fast rotation. So if you were to consider the, the envelope of this, uh, these, time, these time simulations, then you would see that. And you would see a, something that is akin to a canard explosion. But you also have a fast oscillation at the same time. And so you have the canard on the amplitude, so to speak. And so these canards have been uh, called uh, torus canards by uh, people from Boston, Mark Kramer and Nancy Coppell. Um, in a 2008 paper, but in fact, uh, Eugene Izikiewicz had already uh, shown the possibility for such dynamics uh, in his uh, paper on elliptic burster. And you can have headless torus canards, torus canard with that, and the equivalent of relaxation oscillation will be in that case, bursting oscillation. So if you have that and you add a, a second slow variable, then you will see things like this. So these are idealized example where you have these dynamics plus an extra slow uh, variable and you see uh, um, something that looks like a burst and on the amplitude of the burst you have small oscillations due to a folded node. So that's something that we call cyclic folded node bursting and they're um, also interesting okay they're maybe more complicated to uh, construct this is why we have um, relied on these idealized model written in polar coordinate as a proof of concept. But there are recent papers, um, particularly by Theo Vo and collaborators, which show this kind of dynamics in a biophysical uh, bursting model, I mean, neuro models. And this is just uh, one more uh, pictorial illustration of this idea of folded node bursting, where you have a folded node system, but you have sufficiently many fast variables that you also have an underlying bursting 
system and combining the two will give you the folded node bursting. The, the idea is that to understand it and really recognize it as such, you need both information from the fast subsystem, which is the uh, more similar approach to bursting classification, but also uh, information from the slow subsystem, because if you were to rely only on the fast subsystem, then you would classify the transition to burst as fault, whereas this is really folded node. There are small oscillations, and like other 3D bursters, which uh, are fold initiated, but without the folded node. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, so let's see the time we started. Uh, do I have a, like something like 10 more minutes, Benjamin? Or less? No, you, you, it's up to you. You can do the, your 10 minutes okay, if okay. you want. I, I will, okay. Thank you. I will continue and try not to okay. bore you too much. So I still have a few things, but it shouldn't be too, too long. All right. So, okay, so that was the first example where you combine a slow subsystem, fast subsystem, and you can construct and uh, even maybe classify uh, new types of bursting scenarios. Another example where the slow subsystem uh, may prove useful is um, related to parabolic bursting, which is uh, one of the three classes uh, by Rinzel, and where we try to understand whether the slow dynamics, the slow limiting dynamics could also give information. So just uh, a few elements to recall what parabolic bursting is. So this is the uh, prototypical uh, biophysical example of parabolic bursting, the so-called plant model. So that's Hodgkin-Huxley type model with in fact three fast and two slow variables. So it's five dimensional. This is the, the typical parabolic bursting time series where you have this burst and you have the quiescence, which is like uh, some a bit like an oval. And there is, an underlying, I mean, you can imagine that there is like a, like a slow wave and on top of that slow wave, you have a burst and we will see uh, that this image is useful uh, in a moment. These are uh, experimental data from the um, so-called R15 neuron from this mollusk. And uh, there is a, a, a good match, of course. The, the characteristics are really that if you look at the burst, the frequency is uh, low at the beginning, it increases and it's low at the end. So if you plot the uh, Interspark interval, it's large, it decreases, and it's large again when the frequency is small. So this is parabolic. That's the name, parabolic bursting. Been a lot of work on these type of systems in the uh, 80s and 90s to uh, understand it and, and also compare with experimental data. Um, one thing that, um, to the best of my, of my knowledge, was not looked at before, it adds a little bit at least, if you look at uh, such a system like the plant model in a 3D uh, phase space projection where you take two uh, of the slow, in fact, there's only two. So you take the two slow variables and one fast, let's say membrane potential, then you realize that the, um, the family of uh, equilibria of the fast subsystem, which is uh, this green surface, is folded. Okay, this was known already because in fact, what you have as mechanism to generate bursting here is a family of sneak bifurcation, saddle node on invariant circle in the fast subsystem. There's no hysteresis loop, there's no bistability, and the, the two slow variables, they, uh, they replace this idea of bistability when you have only one slow variable. So they organize a circular motion back and forth uh, across that line of sneak bifurcation which allows to generate bursting rhythm. On one side, you have the burst, and on the other side of that line of sneak points, you have the quiescence. So this is all uh, well known uh, since the, the work by, by John Rinzel. However, you do have a manifold of equilibria of the fast subsystem, and that's a folded critical manifold. So you may think that there could be some canals related. And indeed, they will be. So already, if we look at this uh, paper by Plant and Kim, there is this uh, interesting um, element mentioned in one of them about resonance effect, where uh, for uh, very specific uh, values of uh, the input parameter, um, there would be uh, no spike, and then one spike, then a spikelet, or uh, let's say a spike every every other time, and then two spike, and so on. So there will they seem to be a very specific uh, and sharp spike adding mechanism in this uh, in, in the model. And so we would like to understand 
a bit more how this number of spikes uh, uh, exactly uh, is organized in this model. We're thinking, of course, of spike heading via canards. And if we can construct a, a simpler, uh, let's say, polynomial model that would reproduce this behavior. So the folded critical manifold uh, uh, made us uh, suspect that they could be a, a folded singularity. And indeed, there is a folded saddle uh, this time. So in the plant model, which is um, a biophysical model, it's uh, it's a bit tedious to write down this slow flow and really get all the um, algebraic conditions for the folded saddle. However, you can uh, simulate the uh, exact slow flow, the constraint system, and the de-singularized reduced system, and you can also check that you do have a, a, a folded saddle. So complementary to the fast subsystem analysis that uh, characterizes this behavior as parabolic bursting or snick snick bursting, uh, if you look at the slow flow, then you understand that there is a folded saddle. And that's interesting because this folded saddle has an important role to play in the spike adding. So the spike adding is organized in uh, for specific parameter values uh, with uh, corresponding cycles, which really uh, follow the repelling part of the critical manifold and hence have canard segment. And this is one example where you have already three uh, fully formed spike and a long canard segment and the fourth spike, which is not yet completely uh, formed, but in the making, so to speak. And the, the main motor to do that is passage near the folded saddle and canards related to that. So that's interesting. There is a canard behavior in this parabolic bursting model. Uh, and, and a specific type of canard, the folded saddle canard. This is the model that we constructed to kind of uh, get a idealized version of the plant model. We took an in, in marsh rose model, that's a nice template, but we had to modify it first to get a sneak bifurcation, which the initial, uh, with initial parameter values of in marsh rose, you don't get the sneak bifurcation. So, but you can uh, find a parameter regime that does that. And, this is uh, well documented. And also by adding these extra slow dynamics to have now too slow and too fast, which will be enough to get both the uh, folded saddle dynamics and the bursting dynamics and the parabolic bursting. So this is this uh, polynomial model is uh, in phase uh, space projection where you see the S-shaped critical manifold, the folded saddle and moving uh, a parameter you can get uh, no spike with canards, one spike, and then a second spike, and so on. And you, are, you can reproduce this adding mechanism towards the burst. OK. There is something else in these models that we bumped into without analyzing it fully. And we'd like to do that uh, maybe in the near future, is that if you look at the slow flow, which is what reveals the, um, the presence of the folded saddle, there is also something interesting. So folded saddle means a true saddle in the so-called DRS that I mentioned earlier, the desingularized reduced system. But in fact, there is also a homoclinic bifurcation in that uh, DRS, which is in the true slow flow, gives a, a kind of an interesting object that we call folded homoclinic uh, connection. And that's uh, something that we'd like to understand more because it seems to play a, an interesting role in this uh, spike adding uh, mechanism. So. I won't say too much about that, but there is something interesting here, I believe. There are other examples of parabolic bursting models, in particular phase models. So if this example, which is related to the so-called theta model, the, or quadratic integrated fire neuron that was introduced by Armand Trout and, and Koppel, you can append an other phase variable. And then uh, if you add an epsilon, then you can have um, the equivalent of too fast and too slow uh, variables. So that at least in terms of fast and slow variables, you have enough for uh, parabolic bursting, which is the uh, amongst the Rinzel classification, the only one that requires too slow variables. So this particular example that I will uh, come back to for a few slides um, is what has been called uh, the Atoll model by Zikiewicz. But anyway, it's essentially a theta neuron with uh, with a periodic forcing and the periodic forcing written as a, with another phase uh, variable. So this is the critical manifold. So it's two, two pi periodic. And if you look at trajectories, then uh, these are just uh, segments of trajectories. You can see also these, uh, this adding phenomenon that is by varying uh, 
parameter you can get through a, um, a very sharp transition between solutions that uh, will have uh, one less or one more spike. So there are uh, there is a spike adding behavior in this model, and in this case, these are um, specific uh, type of uh, Canard dynamics. There is no per se folded saddle. I mean, in this uh, um, formulation of the model, you only have um, one slow variable, so to speak, one phase slow variable, but you have this uh, uh, jump on Canard. So this is a jump on point. I showed you uh, a very similar uh, configuration earlier uh, for Van der Poel, but what happens is that if you vary an initial condition or a parameter value, you may uh, connect from a, a fast segment directly onto the repelling manifold near this jump on point. And so, of course, this is a rare event, but if you allow one parameter family of orbits, you will go through it and then you can uh, connect through the um, repelling slow manifold and have a spike adding transition. So, this is the mechanism here. And this is an example of a so called jump on canard. There are also work by Guckenheimer and Yashenko on studying canards on the on the torus which is effectively what it is here and uh, without mentioning parabolic bursting but this is also interesting uh, to have a look at so like i said this particular version of the theta model with periodic forcing and a second uh, phase variable has been called uh, the atoll model by izikiewicz in part uh, izikiewicz and openstead in this in this book and also other uh, references why? Because if you, you can, um, in fact, uh, get an idea of the critical manifold uh, in this uh, phase plane. And um, it, first, it's 2 pi periodic, and you have a number of connected components that are round and may resemble an, an atoll or an island. And in fact, the um, robust and typical behavior of parabolic bursting in the quiescent phase is to follow the attracting part of the atoll. But when you move uh, initial condition or parameter values um, across a spike adding transition, then you will see solutions that go to the other side of the atoll. And that's where you have canal behavior. So somehow it's related to visiting the north side of the atoll. A second little parenthesis, uh, it may be too late to catch Jean-Pierre because I think he had to leave. But anyway, it's uh, related to some work I've done with him and uh, where I wanted to just very briefly mentioned the, the work by uh, John Littlewood, because this is also related to uh, periodically forced so far system, in this case, the forced Van der Poel system. And you will see that it's related to what I've just said for the Atoll model. So there are these uh, famous papers on the uh, forced Van der Poel, some with Littlewood and Cartwright, and some just uh, Littlewood alone, in particular, this part three paper where he mentioned uh, a, a phenomenon that he calls dips and slice. So effectively, this is the um, a, a uh, phase plane representation of solutions of the false van der Poel. And at y equals 1 and minus 1, you can imagine that you have the fold lines of the critical manifold. And you already notice the possibility for trajectories that uh, go a little bit below this fold line as plus 1 and either go back up, which he calls a dip. There is a dip, and then you go back up or just uh, jump down to the, uh, the other side of, uh, of the other fold line. And as you would imagine, then these are uh, canards. So somehow these dips and slices from uh, John Littlewood are canards and maybe he's a sort of grandfather of the canards. So this paper is a good uh, 20 years before the first paper mentioning canards. So this is quite interesting. And what we can see is that uh, indeed uh, in this uh, atoll model, then you have the same effect of dips and slices. And uh, this is, of course, during the, the canal regime. Um, what we had done in, uh, in a paper that I mentioned at the end with Jean-Pierre and also Martin Krupa is to uh, look at this idea of uh, dips and slices and uh, relating to the work by Littlewood, also in the Van der Poel system with constant forcing, where you can uh, look at somehow uh, all these. Uh, so these red curves is an evaluation of the critical manifold, but within the time profile of the x variable. And you see that at plus one, you go below uh, the, the fold of the critical manifold. So this is a canard segment. You might go back up, and that would be the dip of Littlewood or you might uh, jump down and that's the slice. So 
Again, I don't, uh, in the interest of time, I don't give too many details, but I'll give you the reference later. I was just uh, interested to see that indeed, uh, um, you know, there was a, a glimpse of canal dynamics uh, in the work of Littlewood. Okay, so the final example I'd like to give you, and it won't be too long, maybe five, six minutes, is also related to parabolic bursting, also related to canals, but now in networks. And this is a work almost finished. So I will uh, happily show you what we've done with a couple of colleagues, and Daniele Abitabili and Bard Elmentrat. So these are networks, uh, not of Kuramoto, but I'd like to introduce the, uh, the setup, which has been done in the Kuramoto oscillator initially. So there is this um, work from a bit more than 10 years ago by Ott and Antonsen, uh, looking at um, networks of Kuramoto oscillator with the distribution of parameters according to a certain um, distribution, so to speak. So the Lorenzian or Cauchy distribution. And in this setup, they could, uh, with an all-to-all -all coupled of uh, such Kuramoto oscillator, they could, uh, in fact, obtain a very nice and exact mean field limit. So, uh, and an ODE at the limit with two, uh, uh, I don't write it here, but with two, effectively two quantities. And a few years after this approach, uh, this uh, Ott Antonsen and Zatz approach has been adapted to another type of uh, phase oscillator for the mi microscopic model of the network, the quadratic integrate in fire neuron by Monrio, Pazzo and Rob Singh in this uh, PRX paper. Same setup, all to all coupling and the Lorenzian distribution. And they show that you could uh, indeed obtain also an, an exact limit with a, a simple description with macroscopic variables, namely the firing rate and the mean membrane potential. So this is a, a figure extracted from their, their paper where you have a superimposed and the match is almost perfect network simulations and uh, the mean field in, uh, in green or yellow, I don't know. But anyway, you have a, um, 10,000 neurons and you have the mean field limit that uh, captures perfectly the behavior of, of the network. Here you see some um, complex oscillation that resemble bursting because this um, network is also uh, periodically forced. So there is an external input that is a slow periodic forcing and that creates this bursting rhythm. So we would like to, of course, um, relate what I've said before of emergence of bursting and spike adding and canards to um, possibly this case of networks and their mean field limit or a particular type of mean field limit uh, in the case of uh, the Ottantensen uh, ansatz. So this KIF neuron that we've just uh, mentioned a bit before with the Atoll model, the main uh, bifurcation structure is a, a, it's a saddle node bifurcation, but on an invariant circle because the main uh, variable is, uh, is a phase variable. And this is corresponding to a, a SNIC. You have a saddle node, but you also have an invariant circle. So that's why on the other side, you have oscillations. And at the transition, you have a zero frequency. So that's the classical uh, uh, type one excitable scenario. If now you force uh, such a Kif neuron uh, periodically with a slow periodic forcing, then you can obtain, if the amplitude is not large enough, uh, subthreshold oscillation that go back and forth near the uh, lower attracting part of this, uh, this parabola, which is the bifurcation diagram of the fast subsystem of, this, of this, uh, the KIF uh, system. And this is the critical manifold here. If you increase a little bit the forcing, you will see bursting. Since this is a sneak, this is again very uh, similar to the Atoll model. You have parabolic bursting. Uh, due to sneak sneak, and uh, if you remember what I've said a bit before, then you would expect uh, that they might be uh, canals and folded saddle because this is parabolic bursting. And indeed, if you adjust the forcing, you see here an example where you stay sub threshold, but you bite a little bit onto the uh, positive side, so the repelling side of the critical manifold, and you have a little canal segment. Another way to see that uh, better and to uh, connect the dots with the parabolic uh, bursting and the folded saddle story is to write the periodic forcing not just as one phase variable, but as two uh, Cartesian variable and have an harmonic oscillator like this. Now you have one fast and two slow, so you have enough slow variables to reveal a possible folded saddle. So in this uh, three-dimensional context, now you have a surface for the bifurcation diagram of the fast subsystem because you have two slow variables. This is this parabolic cylinder. 
and you can find a folded saddle. This is uh, not surprising given what we've said before. You can look at the uh, slow flow, so the slow subsystem, and in fact, you can find the associated uh, true and four canard in the epsilon equals zero limit. There are in fact uh, uh, two homoclinic connection uh, due to the uh, specific uh, type of the slow dynamics that you have here, which is a, an harmonic oscillator. But anyway, if you now um, connect everything, you put the uh, critical manifold, the information about the slow subsystem, folded saddle, and singular canals, and you superimpose the trajectory. I forgot to say that this idea of uh, superimposing uh, full system and fast subsystem uh, bifurcation diagram. Here, there are also slow flow information, but this idea is, is what John Rinzel called slow fast dissection, and it's been used really over and over again. It's a very classical tool nowadays. So here we just add slow subsystem information on top of it. So here you see a small for forcing, you stay entirely subthreshold. Here you have the canal, so you start to follow the true canal, and then you go down. It's the same solution as before, but shown in, in 3D now. And this is the parabolic bursting where you, uh, you don't uh, follow the canard, you just jump, have the burst, and then come back. Interestingly, the quiescence is staying very close to in the other important canard of the singular limit, the four canard. But anyway, the main point we'll try to make here is that there is a transition to bursting, and the sort of threshold is organized by the canard associated to the folded saddle, the folded saddle true canard. So this is in the uh, KIF 1, one KIF system. Now we'd like to look at the uh, mean field limits uh, obtained by Monbrio et al. The, using this Ott Antonsen ansatz. So this is the uh, mean field system for rate and mean membrane potential. You can also add a, a, a synaptic variable here. This is fast synapse. So now we have three fast variables and you have two slow variables for the harmonic forcing. And effectively, we can find a folded saddle. So the uh, folded saddle analysis will still work and we'll still find the canard associated to folded saddle related to the excitability of that mean field limits. And there are two ways to get bursting uh, when you increase the forcing of the amplitude of the forcing. Uh, one way is when the, um, the, uh, the mean field is in the so-called, uh, let's say excitable uh, regime. And this is a uh, sub-threshold and this is the bursting. So this is very similar to the uh, what was shown by Monbrio et al in their paper. Now we show it in 3D, which uh, has the advantage to really show the, uh, the, 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 the use of the slow subsystem information and the true info canal to really understand the, the shape of that object and how it comes about by following the middle branch more and more. So that acts, uh, this canal acts as, as a threshold. So that's a route to bursting from, let's say, down up. You start with the slow forcing on the uh, quiescent si uh, side, and then you increase the forcing, and you suddenly bite onto the repelling part here, and then you create bursting. This is, again, only mean field so, so far. So it's nice. It's an OD. But you can also start on the upper part, because the mean field system has an S-shape critical manifold. It's unlike the KIF system, which has only a parabolic cylinder. But here you have an upper part that is uh, attracting. So you can start here and um, increase the forcing. And at some point, you will equally bite onto the repelling middle sheet, but from the, from the top. And if you increase the forcing, you will also get bursting. So that's a, a different route to bursting from up. So from, uh, let's say, the a tonic regime of the network represented by its, its mean field limit down to bursting. And again, the folded saddle is very important here. OK, what about the network? So here we, I will show you simulations for uh, 100,000 neurons uh, with the all to all coupling and the uh, uh, Lorenzian or Cauchy distribution. So depending on the center of this distribution, there will be two scenarios, whether the center is more on the excitable regime or more on the tonic regime. So this is uh, these are network simulations. Eh? And this is the forcing. Here you see that, uh, indeed, at the level of the network, you can reproduce the uh, down to up bursting transition. This is an equivalent uh, bursting orbit, at least in this setup. 
and you do follow the uh, folded saddle canards off the limit of the mean field limit. So there's a very good agreement between the network and the mean field limit, as expected, of course, but it's nice to see it numerically. It's quite a, a large bunch of neurons. And the, uh, the ODE at the limit uh, and its uh, slow, fast uh, description, its canard, uh, let's say, structure, helps to understand uh, very well how you transit from subthreshold to bursting. If the center of the distribution is uh, on the other side, so the network is predominantly tonic, then you can start by a network that indeed has uh, most of its elements uh, spiking. And uh, you can adjust the amplitude, of course, you have to be a bit patient. It's quite a sensitive uh, search, but it does work well. You can see a network state where you stay mostly uh, near the upper part of the critical manifold and you start biting onto the repelling branch. So you have a sort of uh, canard segment here. And if you increase it ever so slightly the amplitude, then you start to see bursting from the top. And here again, we can see that the mean field does a very good job. And uh, even though we have very many neurons, we can understand using the ODE limit that the, uh, the canard structure of the ODE limit uh, does a good job to uh, approximate the excitability of the AV threshold of, of that bursting scenario from up to down. This is comparison between the mean field at the bottom and the network for 100,000 neurons, again with the uh, mean field uh, slow fast object, critical manifold, folded saddle and canards, but the two systems go end in end, of course. This is down to up and this is up to down. So quite nice and you can see that across scales this uh, sort of folded saddle story for these kinds of networks uh, works well okay so i can now conclude i'm sorry that i've been a little long so in the seminal work on bursting and uh, mathematical analysis of bursting systems and their classification a lot of the work uh, if not most of the work was relying on the fast subsystem analysis however one can also use the information valuable information from the slow subsystem and complete, both complete uh, the, the analysis of some cases like the parabolic bursting and also create maybe a new, new types of bursting systems that may be interesting also in, uh, in applications. So this was uh, the burst, the Rinzel approach, this is uh, the Zikiewicz extended approach. And this is the kind of uh, for the node bursting uh, scenario that you can construct if you also um, appropriately use fast and slow subsystem and also revisiting the one particular case at least the parabolic bursting case okay so if you want to know more because i was very long but also very brief about many details so these are the papers uh, the uh, first example was constructed with uh, tasso kapper and martin krupa in this paper that is not so recent anymore so that's what the new era uh, aspect. This is the example that we constructed. And uh, in chronology, then the uh, parabolic bursting story was done with Martin and Serafim Rodriguez. So that's the figure from it. This the link with the dips and slides with Jean Pierre, Francoise, and Martin a bit more recently. And uh, then there is this for the node bursting. So this is just accepted in plus computational biology. So soon out, hopefully, with John and Serafim. This is one example, and we have many more. And the uh, quadratic integrated fire network story is almost finished, so soon also available with Daniele and Bard. Thank you very much. Sorry for being a bit long. <laughs>